Welcome. This is Dialogues of Plato's Complete Works podcast. Today is January 31, 2021. This episode is audio recording of a live meetup group. We meet through Toronto Philosophy Meetup, Calgary Philosophy Meetup, and Online Rebels Meetup. I am Eva Ellis. I'll be coordinating this live meeting and audio recording. And I'm so excited to pass the screen or the microphone to James Myers, who will be sharing his teachings and handling, facilitating the participant conversation as well. James? Well, thank you very much. I'm very excited to uh, to be here in the, the first podcast episode. And uh, I think especially because Plato is so accessible, I think that, uh, you know, we needn't worry about there being right or wrong answers. It really is, I think, all about the dialogue that we engage in among ourselves. And, uh, you know, here we are about 2,400 years after Plato was writing his dialogues. And I just think he would be so thrilled that, you know, we are having our own dialogue uh, about the the kind of scenes and themes that he presented. You know, certainly Plato doesn't really tell us what we should think. You know, he never really uh, takes a position. And it's one of those things that maybe frustrates newcomers to to Plato is that they get, get to the end of the dialogue uh, that they're reading. And they don't find the answer. They're looking for the answer. Plato says we should think this. Well, Plato never says we should think this. Uh, I think it's more that Plato just kind of tells us how we should approach thinking itself. And certainly dialogue is a significant uh, aspect of that and, and something that he promoted all through his works. And so here we are. Um, we've actually, this is our eighth dialogue that uh, we've done through the uh, meetup group. And a very important dialogue, I, I think, extremely important because it's really about the, well, it's got a number of themes. It actually starts by touching on some of the themes that Plato brings to us in his most, maybe one of his most famous works, The Republic. Then he touches on the legend of Atlantis, which has certainly gripped uh, human imagination for the 2,400 years. In fact, I turned on the television on Friday night and there was William Shatner's Unexplained series and a whole hour-long episode on uh, where is Atlantis? So there's still people around the world looking for the lost continent of Atlantis. And here we are with, with Atlantis being treated in the very first few pages uh, of the Timaeus. So it's certainly, you know, continuing of relevance and, and certainly very accessible. I mean, it's, uh, I think we can read the dialogue, we can imagine ourselves, you know, picture ourselves in the scenario and look at the words that uh, that Plato's writing and, and, and think about their meaning and, and form our own meaning in them. You know, my own beginning with Plato was, you know, back when I was doing a pretty intensive self-study in physics, and a friend pulled out a dog-eared, well-worn book that a school person had, had used uh, from a book bin. It was, it was a printed copy of Plato's Mino, and it was filled with uh, you know, handwritten notes, I, I guess this person had been studying using this particular thing. And when they finished, they put it in a book bin at the end of their yard and uh, just free for the public to take. And so my friend took it and gave me the Mino and I read it. And it's one of Plato's shorter dialogues. And I was gripped. I, uh, you know, the logic just seemed to speak uh, very much. And and that dialogue, the Mino, I think is very fundamentally important to this dialogue that we're going to talk about today, the Timaeus. So the Timaeus is Plato's, uh, you know, great work on the construction of the universe. Um, the first part that we're looking at today, which goes up to um, Stephanus reference number 43e, is really about the construction of the intelligent part of the universe. And this is this is very a very significant theme in the Mino, which I was talking about. The Mino ends by presenting to us the idea that all knowledge is recollection. And in fact, further at the end of the Mino, Plato says, uh, knowledge is the account of the reasons why. And we find this account of reasons uh, here in the Timaeus, in the first part of the Timaeus. So I'd like to maybe, you know, make some connections between the Timaeus and, and the Mino. Uh, and I think also very importantly is another di dialogue that the group has looked at, uh, which is the Phaedo. And the Phaedo is all about the soul. So the Phaedo is is uh, the dialogue where Socrates is is talking about death. And, and of course, Socrates was uh, subjected to death by the tyranny in Athens. And, uh, and the Phaedo is really the presentation on the soul. And the soul is very prevalent here in this first part of, uh, of the Timaeus. So 
Uh, maybe we'll have a chance to connect some of the ideas in the Timaeus to both the Mino and the Fido. And so I'd like to maybe just start, um, there's, there's some suggested readings posted. I'd like to start uh, with one particular reading. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll ask uh, uh, Eva to uh, share a screen is uh, the first paragraph on the second page there, Eva. Yeah, we'll start by looking at 35A to 35B. And then from here, we'll kind of go you know, pretty much where the group would like to go. And uh, so maybe you can sort of think about what what strikes you about uh, particular sections of, of this, uh, this part of the dialogue that we're looking at. But I thought we could start here because there's some themes here that Plato presents and it's, it's particularly the, the way that he presents them that we might wanna consider and, and particularly those last few sentences of this first part of 35A to 35B. So this is uh, further along in the in the section of the dialogue that we're looking at, but I think maybe an important setting for this is the words at uh, 30b. And so I'll just I'll just recount uh, the words in 30b, uh, in which Plato says, and so this is talking about the construction of the universe in the realm of things naturally visible. No unintelligent thing could be could as a whole be better than anything which does possess intelligence as a whole. And he further concluded that it is impossible for anything to come to possess intelligent intelligence apart from the soul. So here we've got this, this idea, and I think it's a very fundamentally empowering idea that uh, here's a universe that is constructed in a way that allows intelligence to be paramount. Uh, and so um, this is really something that, you know, should be empowering to us as intelligent beings, that, uh, that the creation of the universe was really focused on the intelligence as being uh, of primary importance. No one intelligent thing could, as a whole, be better than anything which does possess intelligence as a whole. And so how does a universe get constructed with intelligence being uh, of prime importance? So we have a universe of of physics, um, you know, and we know a great deal about physics and and math and the geometry of physics. But how do we fit? How do we fit intelligence into this? And so, this section, I just kind of struck me as being uh, an interesting place to start. And I wonder if if one of our participants would like to uh, read this this first this 35A to 35B that we see here on our screens. Uh, if anybody would like to. Uh, to read that, um, and I would say uh, one of the things we do in this meetup, and it's worked fairly well, is we use the raise hands feature. Uh, so in, the, in your participant screen, if you're interested in, in speaking to something or uh, sharing in, in one of the readings such as this, please do use the, uh, the raise hands feature and I'll, I'll get to you in, in the order that the hands are raised. Um, but I'll give preference you know, as it goes on to uh, those who hadn't spoken before, um, because we, we would like as many as possible to participate. So do I have any volunteers to uh, to read this first paragraph or, or I can read it if uh, folks would like? Well, why don't, why don't I start by, by reading this section? So this is 35A to, 30, to 35B. And we're talking here about the construction of the universe. The components from which he made the soul and the way in which he made it were as follows. In between the being that is indivisible and always changeless, and the one that is divisible and comes to be in the corporeal realm, he mixed a third intermediate form of being derived from the other two. Similarly, he made a mixture of the same and then one of the different in between their indivisible and their corporeal divisible counterparts. And he took the three mixtures and mixed them together to make a uniform mixture, forcing the different, which was hard to mix, into conformity with the same. Now, when he had mixed these two together with being and from the three had made a single mixture, he redivided the whole mixture into as many parts as his task required, each part re remaining a mixture of the same, the different and of being. This is how he began the division. First, he took one portion away from the whole and then he took another twice as large, followed by a third, one and a half times as large as the second and three times as large as the first. The fourth portion he took was twice as large as the second, the fifth three times as large as the third, the sixth eight times that of the first, 
and the seventh 27 times that of the first. So I just thought we would start here and maybe look at a few things. We can look at the content of these words, uh, you know, particularly maybe focusing on this, this distinction between the same and the different. Uh, but we can maybe look at the style too that Plato's bringing to us because as I find as we examine Plato's different dialogues, there's very different styles uh, from one dialogue to another. You know, the symposium was the second dialogue that we looked at in a very different style, for example, from the Mino, which is the first dialogue that we looked at together. Uh, the Mino being very stark and the, the symposium being very lush and rich with, with background and drama and characters. And here we have an interesting style at the end of this particular section where Plato gets very particular very particular with proportions. Uh, he's talking about uh, about different measures, and I'm just wondering if if this struck anybody uh, as as being a little bit unusual. Maybe you know what is Plato trying to tell us here? Is this philosophy or is this math? What is it that Plato is trying to tell us here? So I'm just wondering if 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 we have any thoughts to share on this particular section as kind of the the starting point for this discussion either the words being or the the same and the different or the or the particular proportions that uh, Plato is talking about here in the last uh, few sentences. Um, JK, I see your hand up. Thank you. Yeah, that reminds me of, is it, uh, he's starting from what um, Parmenides, uh, you know, posited that, that the, uh, that the universe is, uh, you know, is ultimately, you know, uh, oneness and whole. Um, and that uh, <clears throat> he's uh, applying the uh, the what the principle of sufficient reason to to try to um, you know um, explain you know how things what are the what are the causes of of the this uh, of of all that uh, he believes exists it, it, you know that uh, this wholeness. Um, the sense of whole, wholeness is uh, in, in, in in the beginning, and it kind of reminds me of a lot of uh, how you know. Uh, of course, Hegel begins with being also right, and it reminds me also of the Tao Te Ching. It begins with the one and uh, multiplies into into the um, is divided into the many. So it, it seems like a kind of a you know a, a regular pretty much a. Uh, you, you you see this uh, you know quite quite a bit and and maybe he was one of the first to to you know assume you know make this kind of leap that it's it all begins with intelligent this intelligent oneness so I don't know yeah thank you and and you know certainly uh, you mentioned the uh, Parmenides which is you know I think one of or it's it's widely held to be one of Plato's most um, uh, impenetrable dialogues. In fact, one of our uh, Toronto Philosophy Meetup members is attending a full semester course on the Parmenides itself. Um, and you know, the, the, the theme of the Parmenides is definitely the one. Uh, and actually, you know, if we, if we look down on the screen a little bit, we won't look at it right now, but the, the reading in 33b of the Timaeus actually talks about the universe as a whole and, uh, and as one. And so, this idea that you know the universe itself uh, is one single thing. There is no other. In fact, in fact, the Timaeus is in 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 the words that the character Timaeus, who's an astronomer, uses in this dialogue, uh, is he's very specific to say uh, that there is only one universe. There is not a multiple of universes. There is only one. And so, yeah, you you raise this this important point. How how do you have this one? consistent object, uh, and yet we have this kind of variability of intelligence that's contained within this one object. Uh, and I wonder if that's maybe some of the, the words um, in this uh, selection, 35A to 35B, some of this words uh, having to do with the same and the different. Um, so if we've got this one consistent universe, it contains uh, a number of different things. We have uh, Joel and then Jane. Joel, you're, you know. Hey, yep, I'm here. Um, my, my only comment is uh, just a quick question. Is the whole very first paragraph being read, is it 
implying uh, the just simply the ontological argument, so to speak, which is just a branch of metaethics dealing with the nature of being or showing the relations between the concepts and categories in a subject area or domain? Well, that's a that's a question that uh, I think maybe we can we can consider as we continue to talk about the relationship of of the word being here to uh, to the rest of the, the the theme of the dialogue and certainly um, you know the the question of the same versus the different you know it's maybe this this option that we have as observers of the universe. So we are the observers. The universe uh, contains physical objects that we observe. And so how is the universe constructed so, uh, so that it allows us as the observers to observe the, the physical objects, but it provides us with, with options and, and the ability to, to make choices. Um, and so, yes, I mean, you raise, you raise a question, I think, that, uh, that I think we would like to explore. Um, we have Jane. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry, this might be a bit random, but this is a bit backtracking to what was said about Hegel. When I was reading this part of the dialogue, um, I, I had this association with um, sort of like the same, the other. And in, in my book, it was called the essence that which joined the same and the other. I, I had a parallel between um, uh, what would be like called the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. I'm just wondering if anyone had a similar, I don't know, maybe parallel or sim similar impression when reading this part of the text. That's a really interesting point, uh, Jane, because I think uh, as we kind of synthesize knowledge, um, we need to be able to reflect on what is knowledge and what is not knowledge. And maybe that's a little bit of the ontological question that Joel was asking. And then maybe we need to come somewhere in the middle and determine, uh, you know, where the dividing line is between our knowledge as as the observers, the intelligent observers in the universe, and uh, the knowledge of of what we're looking at. Um, so, so thank you for that question. There's lots of good lots of good questions here to explore. Um, I have Alex next. Alex. Hi. Hi, James. Can you guys hear me? Hi. Yes, we can. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is great. Thanks for uh, your presentation and the readings. Um, I guess just want to make pick up on a couple of things. Uh, somebody mentioned Parmenides and also uh, just this idea of a kind of synthesis, and um, I find that really interesting. And I, uh, what's interesting to me in these in this passage in this paragraph is how. Um, there seems to be this, you know, a kind of mixing of these two opposing principles. And um, I think, and from what I know of Parmenides, uh, also just the actual philosopher, right? He, he didn't really go in that direction. It was, uh, the interest was much more just the one, you know, just the, 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 the being that doesn't, that doesn't change. and. Um, it's interesting that here, I mean, Plato is definitely using that, right? And I think that probably remains the most important for him, right? The unchanging or the eternal. But then he also wants to kind of give reasons or like an account, like you were saying, of, you know, what about those things that are a little bit further down the line, you know, that are not the highest, but still have some maybe being in them. And so we get this idea of a mixture of things that have change in them, but also, um, you know, also have this oneness somehow connected. And it's uh, it's very interesting to see how that's going to work out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, and and certainly, you know, the word "being" appears throughout uh, this dialogue, and and in that which is is another term that's used, and I, I'm hoping that we can explore the meaning of those words, being and is in particular. Um, you know, being, I think, you know, kind of clearly comes through in this dialogue as, as referring to universe itself, you know, that which is not begotten, because that, that's the other, that's another word that's used sort of in contrast. Um, so something that's begotten is, is something that is caused by something else, and the universe itself 
is not caused by something else. It is the cause of all things. Um, and so what comes first and what comes second? Well, the, 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 the being that which is not caused by anything else uh, is universe and it contains all causes. Um, and I think that's why, um, you know, that, that this kind of connection to um, to the Mino, which I was talking about at the beginning, you know, where the Mino talks about knowledge as the account of the reasons why. Well, the reasons why are the causes. And it's up to us as the intelligent beings in this universe to make that account. So how do you construct a universe where you have this account of the reasons why? Uh, and, and how does this intelligence fit into it? And so this, this first section in 35A and B that, uh, that we're looking at here now is is really it's kind of this fascinating idea that the the creator i have this picture in my head the creator has this giant mixing bowl and he's mixing a little bit of the same a little bit of the different and he's allowing intelligence to come along and determine how the same and the different interacts and he says it's a very hard mixture to make um, but we want we want this wh why do we want the same well I, I don't know i mean to me it seems that the same is the universe itself will always be the same as, as a whole. Um, as I think it was JK was talking about the one, you know, there, there is only one universe is what the, the dialogue says. So it is the same to itself. And yet here we are within this universe, we're all parts of the universe and we all have differences in our perceptions. And so we're mixing the same universe and our differences in, in perception. So it's a, uh, uh, it, it is actually very interesting to kind of imagine this picture of the the craftsman or the demiurge, uh, the, the creator forming this universe in this giant mixing bowl of the same and the different. Um, we have uh, uh, Gregory and Alex, um, 14165, if you'd like to speak. Okay, let's do that. Okay. Oh, there we are. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um you know, it's interesting that you, you, you said the being being a universe itself, and uh, I'm looking at this uh, same and different being. What type of entity is that is? Like, uh, uh, he seems to treat this as uh, somewhat like a physical objects here. Like, uh, you can divide it and uh, make a mixture. So, so, so if, if this is a metaphor, it's for real. And, and, and it goes back to, to the, the, his theory of a form. Form are really indivisible and unchangeable, and now he he can divide this form. If this form, that is a type of a reality, and not the uh, not the becoming, and uh, so so I feel that these concepts here, uh, are, you know, are quite uh, quite not clear. That he didn't really did you know differentiate uh, very clearly. These, these entity, the beings, I, I would say that same and different are also beings in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's three type of three kind of beings that they 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 treat it as a, a physical object, a mix here, mix that, cut half, cut half. And I just wonder that um, how is Plato um, taking these uh, uh, in in some way that that can be differentiated from the, the, the physical objects or, 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 you know, because if we treat physical objects as not reality, then, then these are reality, they're divisible. I'm, I'm just a little bit uh, quite um, unclear about it and uh, someone can, 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 I hope someone can comment on it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think you touch on maybe a distinction that we should discuss and make sure that that uh, everyone's clear kind of in terms of Plato's concept as, as he's presented the, um, uh, I think particularly in, in the Phaedo is, uh, is something that really struck me with that difference between the physical and, the, and that which is not physical in the universe. And so we've got a visible universe, which is a physical part. And in, um, in the Phaedo, Plato uses the word composite for that. So it's composed of, parts and that's the physical universe of the universe that we can see but the universe also consists of the invisible um, which is the soul and that in the Phaedo Plato calls the non-composite so it's not composed of anything the soul is 
I think um, Plato is inviting us to consider that the soul is really the expression of that, you know, eternal being, uh, really an expression of the universe itself. And so that's the invisible part of the universe. So here we're constructing a universe that is uh, invisible and the invisible part of the universe is the observer that's in each of us. Uh, the part that, you know, I, I can't see inside of me. Um, we can, we can look at each other, we can look at ourselves in a mirror and see the physical self, but we can't see the invisible part uh, that animates us inside. And so I think Plato calls that the soul. And so um, we've got this mixture of invisible and visible, the invisible being the, the non-composite, the thing that is not composed and the, the, the visible physical thing being that which is composed. And so it's interesting, these portions, you know, as you were saying that, uh, that, that Plato talks about here, um, is he talking about portions that create the physical universe or portions that allow for the physical and the non-physical invisible part of the universe to coincide? So it's a, it's a very, it's an interesting question. Uh, thank you for raising it. We'll see what everybody has to think about it. Um, we'll go to Alex and then JK. Alex? Uh, thanks, James. Um, yeah, the last few, your last couple of comments and also the other comment that was made, um, it was making me think of uh, a contrast. Um, I think a contrast to what Plato was doing here. Uh, so many people may have heard of Zeno, uh, the Zeno who gave us the argument of uh, Achilles and the tortoise and a few others. Um, and the Zeno was actually a student of, of, the, of the actual Parmenides. And it was very important for them to prove that change is impossible and change is incoherent, right? And they gave all of these arguments for why, you know, if we take the change is real, we're going to run into all kinds of contradictions. And I think that the Achilles and tortoise argument, where they're kind of, you know, running in a race, um, was, a, was one of those. And, um, and I think it's a contrast because I think Plato, you know, um, rather than taking that route is saying, you know, change is not impossible. Change, we can deal with change philosophically. You know, we can accommodate it. Change is not, you know, preferable necessarily. Uh, there are higher things than what is changeable, but we can make room for, you know, the changeable within our philosophical uh, picture or, or framework. And, um, and I think that's very exciting. And it's, uh, in a way, it's, I think it's an innovation maybe in philosophy as well, and something that will kind of stay in the tradition, right? And later, uh, it, it will become important also later on. Thank you, uh, Alex, for that. I mean, I mean, very important what you, you raise in terms of this idea of change and the uh, uh, and thank you for bringing Zeno into the conversation. You know, certainly the paradoxes that Zeno had are are things that I think that uh, we can explore throughout our our series of dialogues on Plato. Certainly, the um, one of the things that I saw in this particular reading in thirty five eight to be is uh, is the idea of a dynamic universe. And so a dynamic universe is one that accommodates change and change is important to intelligent beings because we don't want to all be on some sort of programmed path and in, in, incapable of escaping our fate. You know, we want to be uh, masters of our own fate um, and, and apply our intelligence to, to, uh, to that purpose. And so here, I think we have a universe that's being created that allows for that. And that's why I was kind of using the word empowering before, that it, it gives us agency um, in, a, in our actions. And so uh, it really is, it's a universe designed for us as intelligent beings to find our way and, and to find that, that kind of beauty of wholeness that's, that's referred to uh, in one of the passages, uh, you know, again, that idea of oneness, but it, it connects, it's very clearly connected to beauty in, in, in the words in this dialogue. So um, very important to consider the idea of a universe that accommodates change, but is itself unchangeable because there is nothing else for it to change into. 
and I think this is this is uh, where we look into the words being and is and and are really under our understanding of those words is is so important. So thank you for raising that, uh, J.K. Yeah, this uh, idea of being uh, as a kind of um, concept of what is you can think of it as physical, but if you only you know think of it as a, as a physical entity, then you, you couldn't imagine what the soul would be like. So in order to, to for that to, to become a soul, an invisible soul, in a, 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 uh, you'd have to think of it as um, completely opposite of being or, or different, you know, which what uh, the word difference would mean. And uh, so the opposite of being would be nothing, right? And so nothingness, if you as a concept, could accommodate what is non-physical and invisible, which be like the idea of the soul. And um, and that comes out in other, you know, maybe other philosophies or you know, um, yeah, thinking of uh, you know later Hegel and also the Tao Te Ching. That's how that Tao Te Ching is able to, you know, uses the concept of uh, this idea of non non being. Mm-hmm. And and uh, and so that's and also uh, Zeno's um, paradox. Uh, those paradoxes uh, uh, can only make sense or uh, or paradoxes if you only uh, you know conflate or what um, conflate um, uh, you know um, time and space as does not that does not account for change, right? And so, if you think of it in those terms, and in, in this kind of ra- you know ultra rational terms, um, and nothing changes, then you could it would be it'd be a paradox. But if you but it, but the paradox say, you know makes sense, and there there's no paradox if you if you you know uh, consider the elements of of how you know time and space are actually um, cannot be conflated or. Or um, confused with one another, when you say, you know. Thank you, and and I just you mentioned the nature of time, and you know one of the themes that uh, we picked out, and we may get to in our discussion today, is uh, when Plato talks about the nature of time in the Timaeus in thirty seven D to thirty eight C. A uh, very interesting way that he presents time for us to consider, and so we'll hopefully get to that. Uh, but you know, as as we know. Uh, from the work of great physicists, for example, uh, Albert Einstein, um, you know, time and space are uh, intimately connected and, and, and not separable. And so uh, definitely something to consider. I just wanted to, um, I, I know folks, we, we didn't actually talk about the chat box in, in uh, Zoom here at the beginning, but I, I know people are posting it and that's great. Um, normally I, I'm not able to focus on both the chat box and the discussion, but please do uh, keep using the chat box and Eva is certainly monitoring it uh, as we go along. I just happened to note a, a comment that Iman made in the uh, in the chat box, uh, which really struck me, it was a short one. The, the soul in its actions is changeable, but in its nature is changeless. So it has a middle status between changelessness and changing. Uh, I kind of like that. I kind of like that uh, expression. So uh, thank you for that. Um, we have uh, again one four one six five, and then Anne. Yeah, that's me. I, I, I don't know why that uh, my name changed <laughs> to a number, but I'm okay, going to change it. You, I didn't know if you wanted me to use your yeah. name, Gregory. So I'm, yeah. I'm trying to respect what people put on their screen. I just want to continue uh, the, you know, the the issue of being that uh, I recently, you know, um, read a. Uh, uh, things about uh, Pamanese. And it seems that the being in Pamanese um, kind of uh, fragments. My understanding is uh, he meant being be what it is. And uh, so anything that what it is, that is being. So it seems to be pointed from, I think it started from Pamanese that everything now started pointed into the two direction. One direction is the real world, and another direction is the reality. The, so, so what is really the, on one hand in the world is the physical thing, and on the other hand is uh, this metaphysical, this uh, this uh, uh, this uh, 
you know, the conceptual thing. And the being is really uh, represented two, two things. One way is the physical, another way is the non-physical. So in such a, in such a way that, that in essence that anything that we're humanly aware can be a being, be physical or non-physical. So that's that's a kind of a Mount ending other, but but it wasn't really very clear in Pamanina because uh, his writing will be very obscure and uh, very very few elements. Most of it is uh, really uh, interpretation of the people uh, come after him, including Plato himself. So I think uh, what Plato and uh, future uh, philosophers will really pick up uh, uh, the the word of what is the being and then elaborated, expanded, and then modified and come to to this. Uh, when when come to Plato is really being through many generations of philosophers. So the being really is becoming much more convoluted, much more complex, and that with loaded with many different interpretations. So that's one. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to make also another comment. It seems I'm reading this, and it seems that uh, Plato is um, is um, um, is making a model, modeling the universe after the living thing. So. So, and then when the living thing, the living thing really is the human thing. So I think the, the, it's interesting that Greek seem to take a, a very human-centered approach towards uh, 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 understanding and explanation, including the, the, the mythology. Mythologies are, are gods and the divine gods are super, super humans. Again, come back, human, human being the base. So here, uh, and and then they and then look at a the human. They look at in the world all the all the living thing. They think a human the smartest, the superior with intelligence. Therefore, the universe ought to like a human. So anyway, I find this interesting. Mm -hmm. well, thank you and, and uh, thank you, Gergi. The the um, certainly Parmenides is is something that we'll need to do a fair bit of preparation for when we get to that one. Uh, and uh, yeah, certainly to understand the meaning of the words, though, is, I think is, is something that you raise is very important. And so there's there's two words in particular, I think, that you uh, that you mentioned, the word is and the word living thing or the, or the phrase, two, the two words living thing. Um, and so those are those are words actually we can start exploring, I think, relatively soon, because I, I was going to move us to 28A to 28B next really is kind of the, the beginning of the train of logic in this whole construction of the universe in, in the Timaeus. And um, the word is, is featured there. I just wanted to mention the, the word living, or the phrase living thing is, uh, is uh, used in this, throughout this dialogue. And it's used with a capital L and a capital T in the translation that I'm looking at. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, you mentioned that that there was that this is connected to human humans as living things, but I'm wondering if Plato is being more inclusive here and in talking about all living things, um, including plants and animals uh, and humans, uh, and encapsulating all of those with that capital L, capital T, capital T, living thing, which he refers to as the universe, as the living thing, the capital L and the capital T. Um, and it contains all other forms of living things, all individual forms of living things. And, you know, the word living in there is something that as, as I was rereading this last night, struck me as being, you know, what, it, what, is it, what does it mean to be living? You know, does it mean to um, have intelligence and consciousness or does it mean the capacity to regenerate? Uh, and if you think about a plant, perhaps a living living plant has the cap capacity to regenerate. And so when you build a universe, you would like, it to contain things that are capable of regeneration. Uh, and so that's one thought that I had on the question of living thing. Um, so let's, let's explore that as, uh, as we move forward with this, but we'll, we'll have, uh, we've got Anne and Jane and Joel next. Anne? Uh, yeah, um, I've had my hand up for some time, so I'm sorry, but I, my question relates to still the prior paragraph. We, got, means, we got kind of derailed on to Parmenides and Zeno, none of which texts we have before us. And we didn't really address that, that paragraph. Um, I, I still am, am, you know, you asked the opening question, which then got derailed. 
why all that mathematics in the latter part? Why all those divisions and subdivisions? And I'd, I'd like to hear some thoughts about that because I don't understand that. And I think it's one of the more interesting aspects of this. Hmm. Well, thank you, Anne. And um, you know, certainly my, my own approach to Plato is from my love of geometry. And so I spent a long time, as I said, in self-study of physics. And in the course of doing that, I got interested in geometry. And so Plato, it should be remembered, you know, is known primarily, I think, now as a philosopher. But back then, he was a geometer. And in fact, above the door to his academy were the words, let no one who is bereft of geometry enter these doors. And so um, personally, uh, and I don't know what everybody else thinks, but we can discuss this. But personally, you know, I, and that, that's why I raised the question at the beginning. I think there is some geometry involved in, in the last few sentences of this section. Uh, and maybe there is some, some knowledge there that we can obtain from, from those words. But we'll, we'll hear from what everybody else thinks. Um, so thank you for, for raising that point. And, and, you know, we don't have to stick to any particular agenda with this discussion. I think that's the, that's the beauty of, of having our own discussion is that we can go wherever the group wants. So I was just starting, uh, I, I wanted to initiate the discussion with this particular reading, but we can go anywhere we like. Um, so thank you, Anne, for that. Um, we'll go to Jane and then Joel. Jane? On the question of mathematics, I was actually thinking a lot about that too. To be honest, I can't say that I've made um, that I've made this uh, logic connection, and I understand completely what Plato was trying to say, or or at least have more or less of a correct idea. My only sort of guess was that, and this will also, I guess, kind of fit into what was said before about the being and becoming. Um, how I see it is that when Plato was in the dialogue when he was writing about being that being which is is so being is and is is eternal so it's actually non-material to my understanding and what we see on the other side of the eternal is the changing so the opposite sort of the other is the changing and the changing is what is becoming but it never is so the changing the becoming that which never is is what we understand by the use of our senses and opinions and beliefs, but the internal, the being that which always is, but is actually non-material, um, we comprehend it by way of reason and intelligence and truth. And the way that I, I guess, saw the whole mathematics situation was that Plato was trying to infuse reason, intelligence, and truth into what is changing, becoming, which is based on sense and opinion and belief by introducing mathematics. And by way of this sort of subject, which is uh, supposed to be based on truth and on reason and intelligence, he tries to infuse the material that which is, um, which is becoming, which never is, which we understand using our senses and opinions. And I, I hope this makes <laughs> sense because I know I'm saying a lot of things right now. So using mathematics as that way of intelligence and the eternal to add to what is opinion and sense and changing but never is mm -hmm. and I also um, when I was thinking about um, this situation of I was very fascinated by the division of uh, the same the other and the essence the es essence being that which joins the same and the other I was thinking about whether sort of intelligence soul and body is also a form of uh, the same the other and the essence, the changing, where um, the intelligence is the same, the eternal, the soul is a sort of essence which joins the intelligence to the body, and the body is uh, the changing. Mm. So that's that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Well, Jane, Jane, that's 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 good. I mean, you you really touched on so many important points, and and what you said, I think, is such a really good uh, lead in to twenty eight. Uh, a 28b which is the the second reading that i thought we could look at because that's really the, i think the start of the, the logical train that leads to that paragraph that we started at with 35 ab uh, if we look at 25 uh, 28 ab uh, i think that really touches on a lot of what you uh, what you just spoke about um, 
you know, certainly Plato in here in the time S, he uses the the, the term uh, a moving image of eternity. You know, the universe is a moving, or what we see as a moving image of eternity. And the word is, I think, is something that that you really um, caused us to think about with your words, Jane. And and I just wanted to throw this out to to everyone listening. Uh, you know, when when you look out. Or when you look at the screen, for example, as you're looking at me talk, um, are you seeing me exactly at the same moment that I'm talking? Um, I would submit there, there's an important, you know, piece of information actually that I learned a few years ago when I watched the uh, the series "The Brain" by neuroscientist David Eagleman. That our brains each take one tenth of a second to process meaning, and so when I'm looking at the screen, I'm not seeing everybody as you are at that particular instant. I'm, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm processing that one tenth of a second later. You know, so I'm looking at, I'm looking at Greg, for example, on the screen now. I'm not seeing you, Greg, as you exist at that very particular instant. I'm, I'm, perceiving, I'm perceiving you one tenth of a second later. And we all work with that same delay in, in perception. And it's just, you know, because the brain has to, needs a little bit of time to process. And so that really raises, you know, using modern science, neuroscience, that really raises the question of what is, you know, is, is, is the word is something that exists at any particular moment? Or uh, I think Plato has elsewhere referred to the present as a state of coming to be. It's not a state that is, it's a state of coming to be. And I think that maybe gets us into understanding that, that train of logic that starts at 28A to 28B. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to interject that and we can explore that in, in terms of the meaning of the word is. And so thank you again, Jane, for, for raising that. Um, I'll go to Joel and then Akosh. Joel? Hi, yes, please. So I'm just uh, really quickly looking for um, a clarification on the word being that's being used. Um, when we refer to the word being, are we simultaneously using that to describe both uh, a person that is aware as well as the universe itself? Is there say like a distinction between the two words knowledge and information? So like, or for example, when I use the word knowledge or intelligence, I'm thinking of, you know, a person being aware of their surroundings and using the information around them. Whereas um, maybe is information just like, uh, like uh, just uh, a definition of like just data or just uh, it's, it's is, is information being referred to as the same word as being like, is it in itself aware? Because then I'm trying to find the difference between um the contemporary definition of a brute fact, which is like a fact that just has no uh, ex further explanation in of, in of itself, or are we using like the principle of sufficient reason where we're, we're going with the method that everything eventually will have an explanation further on? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. It's, uh, uh, and certainly you raise an important point, I think about the, maybe the distinction between information and knowledge. Um, I would think, uh, thinking about how Plato continuously throughout various dialogues refers to, to knowledge as recollection, and in the end of the Mino, he refers to knowledge as the account of the reasons why. Um, to me, that's indicating that knowledge is maybe uh, something that has meaning, whereas information, just raw information or raw data, um, has no particular meaning, right? So it's this, this intelligent part of the living thing, the, the capital L living thing, uh, which is the, the universe, maybe this, this eternal being, the universe that, because there is no other, it, it is the only thing uh, that is eternally being. Um, maybe it's this idea that this, this knowledge or meaning is transmitted using information or data. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating concept, particularly as the world is now getting into the realm of quantum computing, um, where, you know, there is this basic, it seems like a basic kind of informational structure to the universe in which knowledge or, or information can be transmitted. But the question is, how do we construct a universe where knowledge can be formed and transmitted? And where is the 
the kind of functional space for that knowledge in the universe. So it's, uh, you raise a number of interesting points there. Thank you. Um, and, and certainly anybody can, can feel free to, to answer uh, those points and any others as we continue our discussion. So we'll move to Akash and then Greg. Akash? Hey, everyone. First of all, it's nice to be back. It was also nice to hear Alex's voice after a year or something. Uh, so I just uh, I just wanted to uh, interject something with the living thing. Like, what does the why is there the capital L living thing? Why is there the small living? And it's I'm I'm particularly trash at the Greek like old philosophy, but as far as I understand, like the capital living thing is uh, the real true stuff and uh, it's like what plato sometimes calls also the true astronomy or the real astronomy of the real world i think that the craftsman is the creature that renders the living thing into our actual universe and then so there's this living thing and then this living thing is projected into like a three-dimensional tangible space that is receptible of all becoming so that's like receptible to to us or like this particular material reality so i think that the big living thing is the the true everything and then it's projected uh, by the craftsman to this geometry through whatever so that i just wanted to interject with this like well, I, what this big living thing means Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and certainly, again, the, the, the term a moving image of eternity kind of implies maybe some sort of a projection. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we can certainly we can certainly explore that. It's uh, it's certainly a, a significant point that that I think will come up in the next few readings. Uh, Greg? Yeah, I just want to kind of um, continue the discussion because it was uh, amazing regarding information and knowledge. You know, information really is a, a modern notion and uh, and at the Plato's time, it wasn't really so clear. Plato was um, and, and his people was trying to really understand or define what knowledge is and that's, a, that's a permeating in his many dialogues. And uh, and according to you know what uh, uh, his thinking is, uh, well, other than the the being the you know the the essence of of, of, of the reality, uh, everything that the becoming the visible world isn't really not real. Therefore, you cannot pin down. And uh, so all these facts uh, of factual knowledge are not really knowledge. So his uh, his notion of knowledge is very narrow. In 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 later time. I mean, Aristotle seems to expand, say, well, there's two kinds of knowledge. There's scientific knowledge and then there's factual knowledge. So the scientific knowledge really was what Plato is after. And, and Aristotle say, let's, let's continue this and take this, whatever, the, 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 the knowledge about the reality is a scientific knowledge. The, the visible world is factual knowledge. And this factual knowledge later on come to, to today's world, all information, well, in essence, also be a knowledge, but the factual knowledge, according to uh, Aristotle. So I just want to kind of, I, I recently kind of read about this and think about this, and and uh, so, you know, that's uh, that's what I get in terms of uh, the historical development. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and and uh, you know, certainly, I guess knowledge maybe could also encompass the imagination. Uh, and the imagination to me really seems to range from fact to fiction. And so somewhere in there, we need to accommodate the ability to, you know, to kind of change our circumstances and, uh, um, you know, something definitely worth thinking about. And this, this I think, is a really good point for us to jump into that uh, reading. Eva, if you would do the screen share again, um, the 28A to 28B reading here. Uh, that's the middle paragraph there. And yeah, just the middle paragraph on that page. And I'm wondering if if somebody might like to read that because it really it touches on what you uh, said, Greg, but it, and, and it touches really, I think, quite well on what Jane presented uh, a few minutes ago when she spoke. Um, would we have a volunteer who would read this this short paragraph here, 28A to 28B? 
I'll jump in. Okay, thank you. As I see it then, we must begin by making the following distinction. What is that which always is and has no becoming? And what is that which becomes but never is? The former is grasped by understanding, which involves a reasoned account. It is unchanging. The latter is grasped by opinion, which involves unreasoning sense perception. It, be, it, it comes to be and passes away, but never really is. Now, everything that comes to be, uh, to be must of necessity comes to be by agency of some cause, or it is impossible for anything to come to be without a cause. So whenever the craftsman looks at what is always changeless and using a thing of that kind as his model reproduces its form and the char uh, char character, then of necessity and all that he is completes is beautiful. But were he to look at a thing that has come to be and use as his model, something that has uh, been begotten, his work will lack beauty. Well, thank you. And, and here I think is really the, where the train of logic begins that leads us to the conclusion at 35A to B. Um, and, and so in this first step of the, of the logic in 28A uh, to B, um, Plato is saying, first we have to distinguish between uh, that which always is and has no becoming. And I think he's, he's saying that, that that's the universe or the character Timaeus is saying that that is the universe. The universe is that which is and has no becoming. Um, and distinguish between that and that which is begotten. So that which becomes but never is. Um, and so they say here that it's, uh, uh, um, you know, that that which is begotten is, has a cause, right? So the universe itself has no cause, but everything that the universe consists of is caused. And, and so that's the begotten part. And this is the, the, the part that Jane really highlighted when she spoke is, is that, uh, the that which always is, um, which is the former here, the, that which always is, is grasped by understanding, which involves a reasoned account. And so my mind, as I was reading that, went immediately back to the end of the Mino, which uh, in, in which Socrates says that knowledge is the account of the reasons why. So we have a reasoned account, and the reasoned account is what we apply to understand that which always is, all right? But uh, the latter, which is that which is begotten, in other words, the, the things that come and go, the, the, the changing things, uh, is grasped by opinion, which involves unreasoning sense perception. So we have you know, the five senses, and we apply those five senses to understand the, the changing things in the universe. But those senses can't understand the universe itself. Um, so I thought this was particularly uh, kind of a very interesting and clear beginning of the logical process where Plato is drawing this, this distinction between the eternal is and the changing becoming uh, phases. And so I was just wondering what, what people think about that uh, as the beginning of this, this logical train. And then we'll go on to maybe look at, uh, at a few other sections of this logical process. So um, Akash, your hand is up. Thank you. Yeah, hey, sorry. So I have a misunderstanding, I think. So you were saying that the universe always was. From the text, what I understood that is, it's, that's not the case. From what I understood from the text is that the living thing always was. The craftsman always was. The universe is a thing, therefore it has become. Things that become are caused. The cause of the universe is the craftsman and the model of the universe is the living thing that always been, so it has not become. That, this is my understanding. Okay. No, and I mean, yes, thank you for raising that distinction. And so maybe, maybe when I say the universe always is, um, I shouldn't use the term universe specifically like that because it certainly consists of physical elements which haven't always been. 
Um, but the maybe it's the model that it always is. Um, I don't know what, what others uh, think about that. We have JK and then Alex and then Jane. JK? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, Plato's view that being, you know, is, uh, is this rational being uh, is, is kind of an assumption that, um, that that rational being is the true one, the true rational being. Um, you know, so it's, it comes into, it brings into question, you know, there's this idea, this idea that the, the, these forms are rational and they're out beyond our perception, but somehow our rational, our reason can understand what that is, is the, is the kind of question whether, whether that, um, that is the ultimate cause of, of what, um, uh, you know, our empirical or, our uh, existence in the empirical world, you know, and so it, you know, those, those kind of, uh, this, this kind of point, you know, of course comes later with, uh, you know, with uh, other modern, more modern philosophers like uh, Schopenhauer, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, are we caused by this being that we, you know, uh, we posit with our, with, uh, with our so-called reason or do we have to rely on, or can you get a more uh, <clears throat> more realistic understanding of, of what the cause is by looking around uh, ourselves, in ourselves, and in in the in the um, entities in 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 the outside world, in nature itself? And so he's raising, you know, he's he's you know uh, prioritizing, you know, that we're prioritizing. Uh, this rational being that he that he's he's positing here. Mm. Well, thank you. And and um, yeah, the word rational, I think, maybe relates in this particular paragraph that we're looking at here uh, to the word reasoned. So when we talk about making a reasoned account, uh, maybe that's a rational process where we're starting maybe not at the beginning because there is no beginning um, to that which always is. So we start with what we have now and we make a reasoned account backwards, you know, so here's what we have now. How did it get this way? What caused those things that cause, you know, our current situation? Then we just continuously go back to make our reasoned account. Uh, and so maybe that's kind of the, the process that's being talked about here. And I guess to me that maybe that's just one of those cases of Plato's logic that really just strikes me as being um, very compelling. If, if something always is, you can never go back to the beginning. You, you can never find the beginning point because there is no beginning point. So you can go back though and make your reason to count. And so I think that's the the kind of compelling thing here that he talks about. So, so thank you very much for uh, for that point. We've got Alex and then Jane. Alex? Yeah, just on the question of um, if the world, the universe is eternal, uh, I, think, I think that's fair to say for the Greeks um, because there is definitely this uh, eternal uh, realm of the forms and souls would be pure souls would be there as well. Um, I think uh, James, you were emphasizing that. And uh, and there's another point, um, which this I think becomes important later on when Christianity comes about, because the Greeks and I think Plato here, um, they take that there is this eternal matter or this stuff, kind of undifferentiated stuff, that the uh, the demiurge just kind of takes up and shapes into forms, right? And uh, the matter itself is, is in a sense uncreated. Only we can never really know it outside of forms, right? But it's kind of always been there. Uh, that's the sense that I have. And, and of course, when Christianity comes about, that will be very problematic, right? Because God needs to create the world out of nothing. And so I think that's one of those, one of those, um, parts of Greek thought that gets uh, rejected, right? But here I think uh, the, the picture I have is there are eternal forms. There is this matter, which is kind of almost mysterious what it is. It's, it can't really be understood. And then 
the, the mixtures of them, those are created. And those are probably not eternal. You know, they get created and destroyed. And that's maybe what happens when, uh, you know, a person dies. Thank you. That's, um, uh, I actually just wanted to, um, you know, go back. And, and it touches on what you said, Alex, and I think what Akosh asked earlier. And it's in 29E. Um, and it just kind of talks about the the framer, the creator, the demiurge who created, um, who, who formed this, this structure. Um, and he says, now, why did he who framed this whole universe of becoming frame it? Let us state the reason why. He was good, and one who is good can never become jealous of anything. And so being free of jealousy, he wanted everything to become as much like himself as was possible. Um, and so that particular part just kind of maybe addresses the, the motivation um, for all of this creation and, and this mixing of the same and the different to create this dynamic universe that allows for beings such as us to have intelligence and to form meaning and to change things as we desire and to kind of shape our own existence. Um, but this interesting word jealousy in that particular um, section and, and when I thought about it, you know, jealousy can be like a negative emotion. But here I think all that's being said is that there was nothing to be jealous of. You know, to be jealous is to want something that somebody else has. Well, in this case, there is nothing else. There is only the, the creator. And so there is no jealousy. And so there was nothing else to base an image of being the universe or all of existence on other than the creator itself. So uh, it, it was an interesting kind of uh, point that I just wanted to raise there. That was in 29E, those particular words. So uh, we might want to consider that. Um, I have Jane next. Jane? Um, I wanted to add a little bit about the um, the being and whether it could be the universe perceived as the universe. Uh, to to my mind, and this is based on what I've read in this dialogue and a bit on the logic that I understood in some previous dialogues that we went through. So to me, the being, I understood it, the being being as the eternal and the eternal is something intangible because if something is tangible and perceivable by the senses therefore it is not eternal it is not being it is changing and becoming and i guess the the only way that i would be able to say that the being or that the eternal is a matter if i was to think of the matter as something metaphysical and like not turn it into something material and I think that's, yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to add because it's probably going to get messy from this point. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you, Jane. And, and certainly I think you, you're you echoing what is said in the, um, in the <clears throat> third or fourth sentence of 28A to B, that reading that we just did, and uh, where uh, the character Timea says the, the latter, which is that which comes to be but never is, is grasped by opinion, which involves unreasoning sense perception. So we are endowed with five senses uh, and we can perceive the physical world around us. Uh, but what those senses cannot perceive is the metaphysical, and you know, use that word in the in the meetup notice for this, but really not in, in any sort of particular interpretation other than just that which is not physical, that which is beyond physical. Um, so we've got this metaphysical concept. And, you know, I think that's what Socrates continues to refer to through all of the dialogues as the soul, that, that which is invisible. Or again, as I said earlier, with respect to the Phaedo, the, the non-composite, that which is not composed of anything. We've got a physical component of the universe, which is composed of things, equal and opposite measures of action or reaction, um, you know, atoms consisting of electrons, protons, and neutrons. All of that is, is what the physical world is composed of. And we've got our senses, which senses don't have reason. The brain has reason. 
uh, but the senses are unreasoning perception. And so that, as you said, Jane, is what we use to examine the physical universe, but how do we form meaning of that? And, and that, that whole realm of meaning is, is I, th I think if I'm understanding the way you use the word, which is the same way I would understand it, metaphysical. So, uh, so thank you for that. And, and let's explore that concept um, of JK and then Greg, JK. I guess uh, that raises the question of, uh, you know, which uh, has the true knowledge of being? Is it, is it the rational understanding of being or is it the, you know, uh, empirical sense um, understanding of being? So it's possible to say that um, the being that can be spoken is not the real being. Mm -hmm. Or as they say, uh, maybe Socrates might say, uh, he who speaks does not know, and he who knows does not speak. Which is, which raises, it, you know. So, it, you know, it's maybe it's the neither becoming or, or you know, one's rational um, concept of being, but it's the, it's somewhere in between or, or, or uh, you know, neither well, or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah no, thank you. And, and, and certainly as, as our, as our, um, capacity to understand more and more of how the universe works. You know, I mentioned earlier that we're about to enter the age of quantum computing, you know, and there's this whole quantum realm of the universe that really is not fully understood. You know, the fact that, uh, that um, you know, one of the famous quantum experiments is the, the uh, split beam experiment where you have a light shine it, two through, uh, shine it through two slits. And the very act of observation of the light coming through the two slits um, actually changes the scattering pattern of, of the light. And so that's the famous double slit experiment in quantum mechanics um, that we don't really know how that functions. And so there are things that, you know, we, we can look out, you know, I can look out the window and I can see objects like buildings and people and cars, and I can have a sense of understanding of what those are, but there is this whole other realm that really uh, is left to this kind of metaphysical process of, you know, forming meaning of it. And so I think that's the, that's the interesting part that science is, is kind of bringing us to now is that, that maybe necessity of understanding what lies beyond the, the, the five senses. Um, and I think this particular section of reading 28A to 28B is particularly important in understanding that distinction between um, you know, that which always is and the becoming and, and the fact that the becoming is what we access with the senses, but that which always is, is where we have to make that reason to count. And it's, to me, it's a very powerful um, section of, uh, of, of that, you know, beginning process of the, of the logic that leads to, to the rest of the, um, the, the, the part of the dialogue that, deal, that deals with the construction of the universe. Um, we have Greg. Greg? I'd just like to, um, you know, um, ask a, maybe a question or, 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 or inviting some clarification, clarification from other people regarding this being as a eternity thing. The way that Plato um, described his creation of the universe and the soul, indicating that universe and the soul has a beginning. And uh, you know, and it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a becoming. So if uh, you know, if, because before that it doesn't exist, God created. So it's created. Therefore, there's a becoming, and there's a beginning, and uh, and so are the the gods and the souls. And uh, to me, that the only thing that he he thinks that uh, the God thing is exists is. Uh, is this same and different these conceptual uh, beings that uh, was there already on on the matter itself, and everything else is uh, is becoming so. So uh, in relation to the soul being uh, eternal in 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 in, uh, in his other uh, dialogues, and I find that it's 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 not consistent. So anybody like to comment on that? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for for raising that, and I would just um, I would just again recall those words in twenty nine e. Now, why did he who framed this whole universe of becoming frame it? Um, so first, uh, Plato has made the distinction between that which always is, 
And then he says, distinguish that from that which is becoming. And so in 29e, he says, now why did he who framed this whole universe of becoming? So the, 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 the creator hasn't framed that which is because the creator is part of that which is. The creator, the, the um, creator has framed the universe of becoming, which is that part of the universe that becomes and goes. So that part of the universe that is begotten. That's the way I'm reading those words in 29e. So that which is always is. And the creator didn't create that which is because the creator is. And it's just this, this part of the, the universe that's continually becoming, that's, that's being created by the creator. And so it, it's an interesting distinction. And I think that's why the logic... Um, starting at 28a b it is makes that first distinction you have to first distinguish between that which always is and that which is becoming so i don't know if that's helpful and, and does anybody else have any thoughts on that that, that so eva's put that up on the screen again um, that first that first sentence of 28a b as i see it then we must begin by making the following distinction what is that which always is and has no becoming and that which is that which becomes but never is. So making that distinction, I think, is, is important with the, the words that I just read from 29e. Um, so the, the, the creator created the universe of becoming, but not, not, the, not the part that always is. Um, JK. So you're saying that the, um, the creator is is the the creation that we that we are already in and becoming right so i think uh, you know the idea of uh, of nature itself being the creator right right being the ultimate uh, creator that constantly creates who we are and we are in in nature itself you know we are we are the universe we are part of the universe and 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 that is the that is the creation and the creator right is that what you're saying? It's it's like uh, you know, like Spinoza's idea of of uh, you know the ultimate substance is nature, and nature is God, and mm -hmm. and the uh, and the creator. So that, that's that's a very compelling idea that uh, bring forth here. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I mean that that's the way I'm reading it. Actually, you know, they, they just this this beginning of the logical process in 28 AB, uh, making that very first distinction, I think, is so is so critical to understanding all that flows from it. And uh, uh, you know, J.K., you mentioned Spinoza, you know, another kind of geometric philosopher. Um, but I think you know, maybe it's it's in some other kind of religious and cultural traditions too to think that you know we are intrinsically part of nature. You know that 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 eternal being is inside of us uh, always and always has been and always will be. Um, I think that's a, that, that's a powerful idea and I think a very empowering idea as well. Um, so, and, and certainly, I mean, let's, let's certainly explore that. I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't know if others are seeing this distinction in 28 AB that, that, that we need to start with really kind of separating in our minds that which always is, which is the, the eternal, unchanging existence of being, that which has never been begotten. It, it, it has no cause. You know, the, the creator, the, there is no cause to the creator, um, and there is no cause to eternal being. But what is caused is the becoming, that, that continuous process of becoming. Um, Jane. Uh, James, I actually saw it, I guess, in a very similar way. Um, and I think that I saw the, in, in, a, in a person, in a human being. So the eternal is the intelligence, the changing or the becoming is the body of the person. And the soul, and I think this was mentioned by someone in the chat, the soul is sort of like the in-between element. It's, it is eternal and it is changing and it ties together the intelligence and the body. That was my perception, at least, interpretation of what I read. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and certainly this, this idea of tying together um, is something that maybe towards the end, and actually I see we're, we're not too far off from the end. We're, we've got another 35 minutes or so. Um, but there was a part at the uh, in 31C in particular where um, 
Plato talks about combinations of two things requiring a third element, uh, which is the bond that unites them. And so Jane, I think you may have touched on a very important point here that this bond that ties two things together and is that bond the soul? Um, you know, the, the, the kind of, and, you know, maybe when I think of that bond and as you spoke earlier too of, you know, the, the intelligence, the soul and the body, uh, is the bond really that thing, if it's the soul, that it kind of brings meaning to us that makes sense of all of this. Um, so you, you raised a powerful point, Jane, and I'm wondering what others think about that. Uh, we've got Akosh and then Joel. Akosh? So I, I was just writing in the chat about this uh, bonding. So as far as I understand, this is like the, like, I don't know, this is like one of the most, like I think the cool, one of the coolest parts of uh, this piece from Plato, because I think he did, so this, this bonding together is like part of the argument of deriving uh, the four elements from first principles as opposed to like some sort of observation or whatever or using them as a priori and then building the world from them so i think this is the part like the, on the chat this golden ratio has been going on the whole time and i think this is like so he he derives the so he starts with like two things because you need fire to observe the universe and then this other thing which i don't know what is the other basic like air and i think and then I think, and then he starts saying that like you need this third element, and that's because of the Gordon ratio. We always need a third to tie things together because of this Gordon ratio. And then this is like I think the genius part of it that like it derives that we need more elements if we have two, based on geometric principles. So not because of the way this world is or anything. But it is from the living thing, this geometric principle that you need the third stuff. And uh, so I think he gives the example of like two, four, eight. And so to make two related to eight, you need something in the middle. And then so because like two over four is equals to four over eight and backwards. Mm -hmm. And I think this is like the. And I don't remember how <laughs> we get to the point that we also get the fourth thing. I'll look it up. Thank you. And, and um, yeah, I, I haven't been able to follow the, the chat box as much as I would hope, just as I'm focusing on people's uh, um, spoken discussion here. But, uh, you know, for our listeners, you know, the golden ratio is a key mathematical and geometric ratio uh, that relates the smaller and the larger parts to a whole. And certainly, you know, here where Plato is talking about the universe as a whole, a whole that consists of multiple parts or, or comprises multiple parts, uh, you know, that, that golden ratio kind of relationship where, where it doesn't matter whether something is small or large, but everything relates eventually, I, I think is very, very important mathematical and geometric concept that would apply uh, when you're creating this whole, but then you're allowing the whole to divide into uh, many different parts. Um, so it, and, uh, I'll be interested to see the uh, the, the chat record later on uh, after the um, after the discussion is finished. Um, so thank you, and uh, Joel. Joel. Uh, yes, please. So I'm looking for a clarification uh, that was said at the beginning of the meeting. Um, just to verify, what are we saying that uh, the idea of eternity and being are one and the same thing, but the but the universe itself, whether it's material or immaterial, does not have a beginning? Or did we say earlier that the universe is eternal, and then and uh, or like how how does how does that square up between like say if, if all of matter had a beginning, how does that tie in with Plato's forms when there's like at least a characteristic of like, you know, from the cave and uh, coming out of the cave until like a perfect version of that form. So if there's, there's a perfect version of the forms, then there's at least a, an idea of matter that is eternal and essentially never had a beginning. So uh, are we saying that the universe uh, had a beginning or didn't? 
Well, thank you, and, and I think that's a, it's a good question to be to be clear on if if clarity is in fact possible, and you know we'll see what people have to say, but. Uh, you know, the again, I, I go back to that first distinction that's made in 28AB, which is, you know, that which always is. Uh, and that perhaps relates to Plato's forms. You know, that, that eternal always is. Uh, maybe the forms are some sort of um, expression of that always is. And then the forms maybe help us to get into this, into this physical world of becoming. Right, so there's that distinction, you know, that, that there is that which always is, and then there is the universe of becoming. So when we say universe, perhaps we're thinking about that which becomes, because that's kind of our daily experience. So our daily experience is with what the five senses bring us, and the five senses bring us is knowledge of that which is becoming. The five senses cannot bring us knowledge of that which always is. And I think that's what Plato is saying in the very first sentence of 28a um, is, is that you, you cannot have knowledge of that which always is. You, you can only make a reasoned account. You, you cannot not have absolute knowledge of that which always is. So I just wanted to, you know, maybe we can consider that in terms of when we say the word universe, what exactly do we mean? Do we mean both that which always is which is unchanging perhaps and do we or do we mean that which is becoming which is the always changing physical part of the universe and, and how do the forms tie into that i think that would be very important to uh, to explore so thank you for that joel um i've got um jane and then i've got the other joel jane i'm sorry for making so many remarks today i promise this is no going to be the last one um, this is sort of how I interpreted or perceived um, the, the whole situation that, that Joel was addressing. So basically the way that I saw it is um, the, the ideas is the eternal and that they are non-material because they are intangible and basically that the changing the becoming so basically the universe because i understood the universe as being something more or less perceptible and tangible in a way so it is something that it is changing that it is becoming but it never is and the way that i understood it in a very uh, schematic format is that the eternal um the the world of ideas i guess it could be called is sort of the original and the universe that which is material which is becoming but never is is sort of like an imitation it's a very good um a very concise imitation but there is the original which is non-material which is eternal which is being always is and it is based on pure reason intelligence and truth that was that was how i imagined this whole situation thank you thank you jane and and uh you used a very important word there, I think, which is imitation. And, um, you know, maybe Eva, we just in the time that remains, we can just take a, a quick detour. If you want to put on the screen reading number three, um, when you get a chance, and as we take the other comments here, maybe we can just look at this reading on the screen and then we'll have a volunteer maybe to, to read it out. Because I don't want to forget the other two parts of this, uh, you know, some of the other major themes that Plato starts with, which is, uh, so it was reading three of them on the, I think it's on the next page, the following page after that. Um, and um, yeah, so if you go another page down, Eva, so we can just, we can just consider this, this next page that's coming up here. Um, because it, Plato starts with talking about, uh, or having Socrates, um, actually the previous page of it, yeah. The, Socrates starts by talking about what he had uh, been discussing the previous night, which was the politics. Uh, and I think it's pretty cl clear here that it's a reference to, um, to what he's talking about in the Republic. So in reading number three, uh, this is how uh, the Timaeus starts. And it's kind of a curious thing, but I just wanted to get back to this because you use the word imitation. Um, and the word imitators is right here at the end of this particular uh, selection. So um, while we while we go on to, to consider this, um, I just wanted to, to pick up on that theme because it's kind of interesting why 
why did Plato start this dialogue with kind of a recounting of some of these themes that, uh, that he visited in the Republic? Uh, and we actually talked about this two weeks ago in our session on the Alcibiades, um, when we got into a discussion of, of kind of this, you know, was Plato a totalitarian? Did he believe that society should be uh, created in the way that is, uh, was specified by, uh, I think it was Adamantus in, in the Republic, kind of continually set out this, this kind of society where, uh, you know, children would be taken away from their parents, raised without knowing who their parents are, uh, a society that is guarded by, by people that's kind of really incapable of guarding itself. So it needs to have these guardian class taking care of it. And what I picked up on was the word imitator, which is what you just mentioned, Jane. So um, I didn't mean to, I, there was, uh, I, I think I preempted a few questions in my long monologue there, but I don't know if anybody else wanted to interject before we just take a quick read of this section because I wanted to, to maybe just incorporate this uh, before we close out our discussion today uh, is just kind of understanding why Plato would, would include this in a dialogue about the creation of the universe. Is he trying to say something with respect to, um, to this kind of image that we create and our ability to manage our own image um, use the imagination to to manage our own societies. So I don't know if, I think I, I did see a few hands up before I got to this. So I don't know if anybody would like to interject or whether whether we could maybe have a, a volunteer to read this section if we'd like to, to go here, because it does tie into, I think, with what we've been talking about, this, this moving image of eternity and our place of, uh, in this moving image of eternity. Would we have a volunteer who'd like to read this section? Well, why don't, why don't I read this section then? So this is right near the beginning of the, of the Timaeus. So this is Socrates speaking. All right, I'd like to go on now and tell you why I've come to feel about the political structure we've described. My feelings are like those of a man who gazes upon a magnificent looking animals, whether they're animals in a painting or even actually alive but standing still and then who finds himself longing to look at them in motion and, or engaged in some struggle or conflict that seems to show off their distinctive physical qualities. I felt the same thing about the city we've described. I'd love to listen to someone give a speech depicting our city in a contest with other cities, competing for those prizes that cities typically compete for. I'd love to see our city distinguish itself in a way that it goes to war or in the way it pursues the war, that it deals with other cities one after the other in ways that reflect positively on its own education and training, both in word and deed. That is both in how it behaves towards them and how it negotiates with them. Now in these matters, Critias and Hermocrates, I charge myself with being quite unable to sing fitting praise to our city and its men. That this should be so in my case, isn't at all surprising, but I have come to have the same opinion of the poets, our ancient poets as well as today's, I have no disrespect for poets in general, but everyone knows that imitators are a breed, as a breed, are best and most adept at imitating the sort of things they've been trained to imitate. And I just, you know, I think this is maybe pretty fundamental to the message that Plato is trying to bring to us in this creation of a universe that allows for intelligence, the, the, the primacy of intelligent beings. And is he saying here that intelligent beings shouldn't try to just imitate what's gone on before? Like, is he saying something about how we should use our intelligence? You know, he uses the words in here um, that uh, in ways that reflect positively on its own education and training. And so this, this kind of development and transmission of knowledge and how we train each other with that knowledge. And so when we use that knowledge in this in this in this world of becoming that the that the the creator has has formed when we use this knowledge do we use it to imitate or do we use it to continually create something that's always changing and something hopefully that's always better and always more beautiful beauty is another term that was used uh, in in the uh, the Timaeus and it's used in other dialogues as well and I, I found in the Timaeus it was used in particular in the sense of the whole um, there was the 
um, I'm just looking for the section. I think it was in 33b where uh, where Plato talked about the, the beauty of the whole. I'm just wondering what other people think. Do, do people see this connection between why why Plato starts the dialogue with this this little recounting of the themes that are presented in the Republic, and then he goes on to talk about the creation of the universe? Was this just kind of thrown in for you know just dramatic interest, or does it actually have some connection with the whole idea of the creation of a universe that allows for intelligence, a dynamic universe that allows for intelligence. Just wondering what people think about that. Any thoughts? And then does that tie into the legend of Atlantis, which then follows that discussion of, uh, of the Republic? Alex. Yeah. What's interesting about this passage is um, it seems like he is um, in a sense, honoring becoming in a certain way, you know, he is, he's not saying, uh, changes, uh, or, or seeing, you know, seeing the animal involved in battle, let's say, uh, or seeing, you know, the city's army involved in battle. Um, that this is something that should be kind of honored and, uh, um, it should, you know, a poet should sing its praise. Although the poets, it seems, are not the right, the right people for that. Um, so it's interesting that there's some truth in a way, or something beautiful to be found in the way things move, in the way they kind of display their their properties in in that kind of uh, motion. And uh, and it does make me wonder. So who can do this then? If it's not the poets, maybe is this the philosopher's task? Uh, and I think the, the question you're raising is really important about, um, exactly how, so if the, is, is it imitation that, um, that can do this job and it doesn't seem like imitation is the right activity and then, and then what is the right activity? So for me, it raises a lot of questions. I'm not really sure what to say, but maybe this different, I think you were alluding to this, uh, possibly James, this difference between the poet and the philosopher which we see, of course, in other dialogues, the Republic, There's, there are long sections on that. Um, so maybe that's an important uh, distinction here. Well, Alex, I mean, thank you so much. I mean, you, you had that lovely phrase, honoring becoming. Uh, I, I really picked up on that. And I, I think that's really important, you know, and it ties into our, all of the discussion, I think, that we've had to this point, this idea of becoming versus being, you know, as kind of two different states. Being is always there. Becoming is something that continuously happens, but being is always there. And and I, I really like the way you put it that this is kind of this idea of honoring becoming. Do we do we continually strive to become and continually strive to become better and more beautiful, or do we imitate that which has come before? Um, and I just wanted to kind of relate that again to the legend of Atlantis, which is fairly short in this part of the dialogue that, uh, because that, that follows this, you know, where, where Plato is recounting this ancient, you know, civilization that, you know, Socrates says, yes, it absolutely existed. Socrates says that in here. It's a relatively short account in here, but he's talking and Ed is just putting up on the screen. I don't think we'll have time to read this particular section, but we can look at it on the screen. Um, He's talking about uh, this civilization that enslaved people and and so on. The you know who's actually was a predecessor of, of Plato's and the great lawgiver of of Athens um, had this discussion and found out about this ancient civilization. Now Plato talks about this you know and reminds us that there are these civilization destroying events caused by fires and floods. Uh, there's actually an allusion in here that could be read as a reference to the uh, asteroid strike that happened that wiped out the dinosaurs. Um, he talks about a fire that that obliterated the entire planet. And so memory is lost over time. And so we maybe think that we can reach out and imitate these ancient societies like Atlantis, which was this society that had incredible technological power. Um, but in doing so, are we honoring our ability to become? And I, I really like that, the way that you put that, Alex. You know, do we continually honor our ability to become, 
or do we try to imitate great things that have happened before, but our memory is, is very vague because of these events that you know, destroy memories. Um, so an important idea, JK and then Anne, JK. Yeah, I want to make a uh, comment about the last one. They, where he uh, compares, perhaps he's comparing um, humans, you know, human culture um, at that time, the poets to animals who are driven by instinct to, you know, do the same thing over and over and, um, and not be able to, um, you know, um, become better. And maybe that's where, you know, you know, he concludes that, you know, reason, the philosopher uh, is the one, you know, relying on reason to overcome the instincts, uh, overcome what is, uh, you know, how one is naturally driven by by nature or by culture to just imitate uh, the same kind of uh, activities without, uh, you know, becoming better or going beyond uh, what is, uh, you know, what just becomes uh, over and over. Thank you. And, and, you know, certainly that ability to reason, I think, is maybe one of the things that Alex was pointing out to when he asked, you know, who can do this, uh, you know, this honoring of becoming, uh, you know, maybe here is uh, Plato is saying that the, the poets don't necessarily appeal to reason. Maybe they appeal more to emotion, you know, with the beauty of their words. Uh, and so maybe it's reason, which is philosophers, but maybe it's, maybe it's anybody who really develops knowledge and understands that knowledge is, is both recollection and the account of the reasons why, uh, as again Plato says at the end of, uh, of the Mino and then throughout a number of other dialogues. So um, this ability to reason, I think, is, is something that you pointed out is, is very important. Um, I have Anne. Anne? Uh, yeah, first, as, we, as we're winding up, thanks so much, Jane, James, to you and Ava for pulling this all together and curating it. Um, it's nicely done. Um, also, I wanted to kind of do pushback on the idea that that paragraph, uh, the prior one, prior to the Atlantis, has to do with honoring becoming. Um, I read it completely differently. I think Socrates, the way it hit me at least, is that Socrates is slyly questioning, um, you know, whatever it is they discuss that they're all referring to, they discussed the day before. Um, is this this human construct? Here's what the military is going to do. Here's what the you know forest people are going to do. Here's what everybody's going to do, and it's going to be fine. But he's basically saying, you know, you know, but I'd kind of like to see that in action, not just in this set, you know, picture, uh, the static picture. But I, I'd like to see that. And I don't think he's saying because I want to honor the concept of becoming. That that sounds way too modern to me, frankly. I think what he's doing is really the question saying, look, uh, when you put this into play, this picture, just like you put take animals out of a picture and start to let them really interact in nature, things aren't going to be what you expect. Um, and so so I think this is more cautionary than, you know, this sort of more, like I said, it sounds very modern to me, this take on, oh, let's honor becoming. Um, I, I think there's a great deal of, um, uh, what shall I say, caution about the becoming aspect of it as compared to the uh, being aspect of it. Uh, you know, a certain, a certain call for, look, you may you may be being a little overweening in this. Uh, there, it's almost like a caution to, to a certain humility that it, once you put that, that static scenario into actual play, more than likely it's not going to play out like some machine that you've created um, uh, since you're not creators, any, the creator anyway. So yeah, I don't think it, the honor of becoming, honoring becoming is, you know, very, uh, you know, smooth, but I, I don't think it's applicable here at all. That's not the way I read this at all, but just my thoughts. Well, thank you, Anne. And, and um, I, I think actually we're, we're probably reading it the same way. And I, I'm thinking that Alex, maybe when he said honoring becoming, it was more in the sense of a bit of a cautionary 
uh, advice as well. Uh, and that's the way I read it too, you know, that, uh, as you said, you know, um, in, in saying this, Socrates is saying that really what they talked about the night before, and I think a lot of what's reflected in the, that, you know, kind of what seems to be a totalitarian structure in, uh, in the Republic is we need to be cautious about that because, as you said, if, if you actually put that into motion, it, it's, it's almost like they created a two-dimensional construct. But if you were to put it into motion in three dimensions and then add time to it, um, then it wouldn't work. And I think that's, that, I think that is what Socrates is saying here. And I think that, um, I think that that's kind of consistent in a way with what Alex was saying is that instead of imitating, and, and when Alex said honoring becoming, it, it's, that that's different from imitation. Um, and so imitation is, I think, you know, the point was that that's where you're not honoring becoming. You're just trying to imitate something that has become before, but you're not trying to exercise your power or your agency in becoming, which is that, you know, that, that cause that we need to continually move ourselves forward with. So here, here we've got this wonderful image of Socrates saying, gee, we created this two-dimensional structure the day before when we were talking about politics. But if you put it into motion, as you said, Anne, uh, would it really work? And I think that's, you know, time has told us, no, that that's, that's not something that would really work because what does it do for the soul? What does it do for the spirit? You know, where, how does it motivate us to continually become better than what we have been? How does it motivate us away from this imitation? And I found that very powerful, you know, the, as I thought about the, the reason why Plato started this dialogue with that discussion, with those references to the Republic, and then that reference to Atlantis, I think, you know, as you said, Anne, I think it's, it's really a bit of a cautionary tale. And then he goes on to talk about the construction of a universe that allows for this, this bonding of the soul, uh, you know, to the physical and to the metaphysical and to knowledge, you know, as, as I think Jane said very powerfully earlier, you know, this, this, this ability of the soul to continually determine its own outcome comes, uh, but based on knowledge, which is, is so fundamental to all of Plato's dialogues. Uh, yeah, yeah, just to, to comment real quickly um, in response to, yeah, again, I, I, don't see an, I don't see a harmonization with the honoring um, becoming assertion. I, I don't think it has anything to do with honoring becoming. I, I think that's a very egocentric, modernistic kind of take on it. I, you know, I think... Uh, I think Socrates is, uh, and Plato, uh, or Plato, is uh, approaching this from a very um, societal fabric frame point, not from the individual, you know, again, the modernistic union, I am my, I can become what I want to become, et cetera. It's not I, and it's not about becoming. It's about social fabric and the pitfalls therein to, uh, you know, the classic Greek concept of hubris as to exactly man's role in the larger com cosmos as created by the one being, whatever that may be. Well, well, thank you. And, and certainly, you know, the, the fact that we can all have different perspectives and find some common ground in our perspectives, I think is, is very important, you know, certainly in the, in the whole construction of the, the universe that, that, Plato has started to tell us about here in, in the first part of the time yes, that we looked at this week. Uh, and so I think, you know, this, this discussion that we've had today is really a, a good demonstration of that, that we can all come together with different perspectives and, and share ideas and discover, hopefully we've discovered knowledge that, uh, that we didn't have before. Uh, we've derived our own knowledge. And I think that's uh, very, something very important in the whole dialogue process that, that Plato sets forth and the fact that we can have different perspectives and, and um, you know, different, different senses of what's important and priorities um, it is so key. And, and I just, I love reading, I just love rereading the Timaeus, as I said, the, the third time, um, because every time I read it, I, I get something new I hadn't picked up on before. So um, I just, uh, we're just ending about to end here. Um, but I wanted to thank everybody for participating in, in such a great discussion. 
I think what we'll do in the in two weeks' time is uh, we'll continue on with the rest of the Timaeus. I think it would be natural for us to continue th this discussion. There's there's points that we didn't have a chance to get to. I think others were saying things in the chat box that would be great if we can uh, get some of those points out. Um, and then also just explore the remainder of the logical process that, that Plato wants to, to bring us through in considering the construction of a universe that allows for, for all of us as individuals to do what we're doing now. And um, again, there's no right or wrong answers. It's great to see so many new people joining us in this dialogue and uh, everybody is more than welcome and you know, just, just so glad that we're uh, able to have this chance to share some time together and to share some knowledge. So I will pass it over to Eva to uh, kind of wrap up today's session as we're uh, running out of time, unfortunately, but we look forward to resuming our discussion on the time AS in two weeks. So Eva, over to you. Thank you, James. This was Dialogues on Plato's Complete Works with James Myers. Thank you for joining today's live class and discussion. It's always exciting to hear the group's comments and questions. I think this would make Plato or F. Lauten proud. I'm Eva Ellis. It has been my pleasure to coordinate today's Zoom meetup and the podcast recording. Until next meeting, friends, stay well.